Okay, uh, I've not come here to complain, but I would like to point out that uh, sustainability really um, places a strain on the engineering profession because engineers are asked to deliver more and more complex devices that can do their job under more and more complex circumstances. And that is a problem. Why is it a problem? Um, just imagine we want to de design um, a gear. Right, so for a gear, the most important factor is what's the diameter, what's the radius of the gear. Right, so for example, for one gear, I could choose seven steps, how, uh, how big or small that gear would be from smallest to over medium uh, to largest. So for this one gear, I have seven design choices. If now I want to make a little gear train, but I attach a second gear, now I have seven times seven, in other words, 49 design choices. If I add a third gear to that, I would have seven by seven by seven, 343 choices, but right? if I write this as a function, right, I get what mathematicians call a combinatorial explosion. So with the number of, um, with the number of parameters, with the numbers of gears I have, uh, the, the number of possibilities really goes up really dramatically. Right? So in this graph uh, on the right hand side, I've shown you for comparison exponential growth. Exponential growth is already something that happens, uh, is a very powerful force. Right? So that's uh, compound, uh, compound interest, right? how rich people get richer. Right? So that's, that's very fast, but uh, combinatorial uh, explosion readily beats that. Uh, so here is, for example, a, a little Rube Goldberg machine right of 100 gears. So if we just allow for seven different sizes for each of those gears, we would get 10 to the power of 84 possibilities for just this, to design this machine. Right? By comparison, the visible universe contains about 10 to the 82 atoms. So, 100, so there's 100 times more combinations in that 100 gear, gear train, then there is atoms in the visible universe, right? So how can we design devices that have so many possibilities in them? What, what are ways to do that? One would be using analytic math, right? So trying to find closed form mathematical expressions to describe what's going on. So here you see an example for a simple robot arm that just has two links and you can write down how this thing behaves with sines, cosines and so on. And if you can do that, that is very powerful. But what if you have a structure like bone in the human body? Right. Can you write down the force distribution in a structure like that with sines and cosines? Probably not. Right? So now we need to have something different. Another approach would be to say, okay, we, we want to test it then. We just build a prototype and we test it in the real world. And here I've brought an example where this is particularly expensive. This is about airplanes. Actually, you can find pictures like that in the somewhat um, nuttier corners of the internet where people deal in conspiracy theories, right? and they would say, yeah, you know, the government or some other sinister force is poisoning us all from airplanes, right, where they spray toxic agents uh, uh, down onto the earth, right? And then when you see these pictures, they say, see, told you, here's an airplane full of tanks, right? But what that is actually, it is for aircraft testing, right? So if you design a new aircraft, you need to test a new aircraft, you put these tanks into uh, a prototype of this aircraft and you can use that to test how the aircraft reacts to different distributions of float. Right? And that, of course, is a big effort. Right? So you have to design the new aircraft, you have to build the new aircraft, you have to install those tanks into it, you have to fly into the sky with those things and then you have to do all the testing, moving the load around. Right? So you, you can only do that so often. Right? And because that is such a difficult process, I mean, not just this one step, but designing, testing a new aircraft, that's probably why aircraft are so conservative. Right? So if you compare an aircraft design, the first jet 
air aircraft, um, but from designed in the late 1940s with sort of Boeing's latest Dreamliner, you can see that there's a lot of similarity. Right? But on the other hand, you watch science fiction movies and you see how the aircraft there, what they look like. Right? You, you, you would expect much more of a change, but that's simply due to the fact that using Photoshop to design or however these movie animations are made, I think it's something like Photoshop probably. So um, that is so much easier than actually um, designing, um, building, testing um, the real thing. Um, of course, you would say, yeah, there's computers today, but we have powerful computers. Can't we use powerful computers um, to do engineering design? And the answer is yes. Right? So for example, uh, here's an example where one computer program optimizes another computer program. Right? So take a simple computer program and you let another computer then figure out, the computer figure out how to rewrite that program, optimize it for a certain purpose. Right? And so with this, you can not quite get to the astronomical numbers that I've shown you with the atoms in the visible universe, but you can get to hundreds of billions of tests that you can do. So that's nice, but the problem is a computer program that is that simple, it tells you very little about the real world. Right? So you can maybe put something like Newton's law in there, but things that really describe the complex systems that we want to design and that we need to design today, it just doesn't fit in there. You can make computer programs that capture this, that capture complex physics. So here's a shameless plug from our own research on the flight of bats, how do bats fly. Right? And so uh, this is uh, a research where my colleague Dane Stafti and I have uh, um, gotten shapes from bats as they fly and then Danesh has put them into a really complicated physical simulation where he can simulate the, um, the airflow around the wing, but running such a simulation, even on, on a really powerful supercomputer, still takes many days, right? So you are, with that, you're not quite back to square one, but maybe you're back to square two when it comes to how much can you actually cover. Right, so that's a, a fundamental a dilemma for engineering, right? That our methods just do not have the scope to deal with the complexity of the solutions that we need to develop, right? And so that brings me uh, to this uh, question, is there any other processes that uh, we ca could use, that we could uh, to, to solve these problems? And the, the answer is biological evolution, right? So biological evolution has really a vast scope, right? It has operated over time scales that are really start almost at the beginning of the Earth, right? So this is an example of what might be the oldest fossils in the world, right? 3.7 um, billion years old, right? So evolution has th this very long time horizon. Um, it has a really large number of different species, right? From an engineering perspective, you could think of each biological species as a a test series right, where you say, okay, what if I design it this way? Right? And we don't know how many species there are in the world today. In the, we don't know for the world. We don't even know for the island of Borneo. The figure that I've brought you here shows you a way how uh, scientists try to estimate that, right? starting with the top level biological groupings and then going finer and finer and extrapolating to the species level. And it could very well be that we have close to 10 million species uh, in the world according uh, to this estimate. Of course, there have been other species, right? You know, the dinosaurs are gone and so on. So also a very, very large number of different uh, types uh, of organisms that evolution has been, been working with. And then finally, there's the individual uh, dimension, right? So within one species, uh, the, say within one species of fish, the individual fish, they differ. Right, and so that's also a way for evolution to figure out what is the best way, what is the best design for that particular type of fish. Right, so you have these, uh, you have the time dimension, the species dimension, the individual dimension, where evolution is uh, vastly more expensive than anything that we could do uh, in engineering. And uh, so that is the idea. Right, can we actually, as engineers, um, benefit from that? gigantic process that has been 
going on almost since the surface of the Earth uh, cooled down uh, far enough, right? And so what evolution is really is, is also some kind of optimization process, right? And that's what you want to do in engineering too, right? So maybe if you look at it from an economics perspective, right? You have a company, then you look, maybe you look at your cost and you want to minimize that or uh, in, as a function of some parameter, or you look at your profit and you want to maximize that at some uh, function uh, of a parameter. And um, evolution, again, it has this big scale where it can do test for all those things, but it is also a very smart process, right? Because if you see how evolution works, right, it has a deterministic component that is natural selection, right? Where you look at the organisms and based on how well they perform, you select them or you uh, don't select them, uh, select against them, uh, but you also have a random component, right? Things like mutation. Right, that you cannot control. And why is that important for optimization? Right? If you have a fitness landscape like you see in this picture, where you have local maxima and then one global maximum, if you just had a deterministic process that drives you up the hill, right, you might very well get stuck on one of those local maxima. But if from time to time you make a random jump somewhere else, right, so you jump over the fence to see if the grass is greener on the other side, right, that can really help you to deal with this kind of problem. And actually, some of the most powerful optimization methods that we have today, genetic algorithms, they are actually inspired by that. And there's also methods for training deep neural networks on the forefront of artificial intelligence that is also inspired by, by this combination, this super powerful combination of a deterministic and a, a stochastic uh, component, right? So, so that's why evolution is so interesting for engineering, right? Because it operates on a scale that we cannot replicate. And it is also a super smart process that is really very well set up for ferreting out uh, really good solutions. There's two caveats. So, right? so the first caveat is evolution does not care about our engineering needs, right? It is geared towards what biologists call inclusive fitness. So how many copies of your genes can you get into the next generation by your own reproduction and through family members, right? That's why it's called inclusive fitness, right? That's why animals often help their family members, probably why humans have involved, evolved living in families, uh, helping each other, right? Because with that, you can also get copies of your genes into the next uh, generation. So if you have an organism, right, where a certain function is really important, say you have a bird of prey that captures its prey using vision, right, you can imagine that you will probably get a really good vision system, right, but if you have something like a bat that uses sound to find its prey, right, then maybe the eyes are not really something that we should look at from an engineering perspective, right? So that's the first thing to bear in mind. Do we actually have the same goal? The other thing that is important to notice about optimization is that very often it's not just about this objective function, right? Say the cost or the, the profit that we want to minimize or maximize. Often there's also constraints, right? So here in this example, the color codes for the value of a two-dimensional function and the, the magenta spot is the minimum that I want to find. But this time I'm also imposing some constraints, right? So I'm saying that my solution must be in that pink uh, rectangle there, right? And so uh, if I start shifting that rectangle, as long as the minimum of the function stays inside, right, I'm fine and nothing happens to my solution. But as soon as the, mi oh, the global minimum is not in the constraints anymore, right? So now my uh, solution depends as much on the constraints as it depends on the function itself, right? So to understand the outcome of an optimization process, I need not only to ask what is the function that I want to optimize here, I also have to ask what are the constraints, 
Right? And so that is also very important if you look at biological systems from an engineering perspective that you have to ask yourself under which constraints do they operate. Right? So an example is how do insects breathe. Right? So long, long time ago in evolution, insects decided we are going to aerate our muscles, we are going to get oxygen into our muscles by having pipes running from our body surface into our body, right? And that principle has its limits, and it actually limits the size that an insect can grow. So if you belong to those people who have nightmares once they see monster movies with gigantic insects, right, you can sleep, right, soon bedtime, you can sleep uh, uh, peacefully, right, because there will never be such gigantic monster insects. There's just a constraint on this functional um, principle. So uh, once we have understood that, right, what, we, what we can say is, if we understand the cost functions, if we understand the constraints, then the tree of life right, can really be a source of engineering knowledge, and that knowledge comes to a large extent from the connections. Right? So you have connections between organisms uh, one set of connections comes from evolution, right, from the phylogenetic relationship between these organisms, and the other one comes from the ecology, right, that either binds or separates different organisms together, right. So, and if we understand these connections and if we understand what they mean, what insights we can gain about finding solutions to problems, varying solutions to fit different problems, then we can treat the tree of life as a natural resource, right? That over three point something billion years has uh, um, produced a myriad of optimized systems and devices, right? So it's actually funny to note that that tree of life also has uh, produced a fossilized biomass, right? That we can now access as gas or oil or coal, right? And so we have gotten in the past hundred or so years, we have gotten brutally efficient in retrieving this garbage of evolution, right? The fossilized biomass and probably too efficient for our own good, right? And so the question is now, with all the engineering insights that has been, have been produced by evolution, can we turn the biodiversity of an amazing place like Borneo, right? Can we turn this into a knowledge mine, right? Something that could power the knowledge economy of the 21st century and do that in a completely sustainable fashion. Thank you very much.